was one of the simplest basically required one change of, of top one tableau um, one of the simplest um, simplex method um, and number two if you look at if you look at the the primal problem that was given you look at it as not having inequalities for x greater than or equal to zero then remember I said you should automatically think that the dual is a standard form so it has equality and y positive so it was so if you, if you kind of started with that thought in mind then you didn't have to kind of go through, you know, bring this to canonical form, then go there, then go, you know, back to, I mean, in the end, you end up with a standard form. Um, so you could just write that immediately, and you see you have two equations with two unknowns, so that's, has a solution, right? So it's basically one point. The only time when you may not get a point that's feasible is when the solution is not in the first quad quadrant, right? But in this case, it was so. Um, so that's the feasible, optimal feasible solution. You have only one. So it's kind of nice. You know, you solve a linear programming problem by converting to a dual, which has only one solution. So you don't have to optimize anything. So anyway, that was problem number three. I mean, all it took was was a, a, a picture drawn correctly. Optimization. And of course, setting up the KKT system right, which had two cases. So again, I'm looking at my solutions. If you follow through, so I don't have to write any things. So let's let's start with problem number four. Any questions from one, two, three? Okay, so number four. So number four is basically uh, it's a minimization or actually an optimization. So min or max of basically distance from the origin to the set. in Rn, okay, and X positives, that's important. So all the X's are positive. Okay. So this is exactly the feasible set of a standard linear programming problem, right? So remember what this 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 had a kind of a I mean it wasn't it's in several dimensions so you cannot really plot it but what it is is actually a it's hard to plot actually well in two dimensions it would be something like this right it would be A translate of the kernel of the matrix A, right? So the set of, of x for which Ax equals 0. 
translated, right? So you get AX equals B, and then it's chopped by the first quadrant in 2D. Okay? So this is the region S. So it's actually, I mean, in 2D is a line segment. In several dimensions is what? It's a convex set, right? It's basically, it's a flat, affine space cut by that first positive cone. And the simplex method basically searches what? The extreme points of this convex set. Okay. And remember, the extreme points of this convex set are um, characterized by what? So the extreme points of this have at least n minus m um, zeros, right? So remember, I, I mean, I mean, I'm not not really going through the solution of this, but I'm just trying to kind of give you the uh, the justification behind this problem. Um, so we assume that this is not empty. That's that's a that's an assumption you have to make. Otherwise, you have no. You may have that affine space. You may have this not intersect the first quadrant, so it might be somewhere else, right? <clears throat> so, the question of, I mean, the question of uh, minimizing a linear functional function over that set is a linear programming problem, right? If I had a linear function, c times x. But here I don't have a linear, I have a quadratic function, is, is the distance from the origin, right? So, so immediately one, one has to kind of think, you know, in this convex set, in this in this you know, set S, what are the points that are closest to, to the origin and what are the points that are farthest from the origin? Right? Well, just think in, in 2D. I mean, the point closest to the origin in this in this picture would be what? Somewhere in be somewhere in the positive cone, that is, all x's are non-zero, right? Meaning that in the KKT, all mu's have to be zero. So that's why it's important to kind of set what is the KKT for this problem, for this for this problem. Gradient of f plus mu gradient of g plus lambda gradient of h equals zero. You know, mu times g is zero. Mu positive or negative, depending on um, whether you have max or minimum. And what is g less than zero? h equals zero. Where? What is g? Well, what are the inequality constraints? X positive, right? So minus X is, has to be negative. Well, to make it negative, we have to put negative X. And what is H? AX minus B, right? So notice what's going to always happen here. At a point where you have a KKT solution, mu times X has to be zero. 
So at a kkt point, mu times x has to be zero. That is mu i times x i has to be zero at each point. Okay, so they are sort of complementary. That is. If mu i's are zero, I mean either some mu i's are zero or um, the x i, the corresponding x i is zero. Right? How many cases would you have? Sort of, you know, if you close your eyes, you would have you have three x's. I'm talking about uh, part b. You know, I mean part b was sort of illustration of what 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 will happen in general. If you have three variables, then you have two to the third, eight cases that you would have to consider, right? Um, but if you kind of look at the picture, if you have the picture in mind, then you'll say what? Well, for the minimum, it's what cases corresponds to the minimum? When all x's are positive. That is, when the mu's are all zero. Okay, so that's one case that you just have to consider, right? And that would basically, when when all mu's when all mu's are zero, what what is happening? You basically don't have the x positive is not an essential constraint, so you basically have a minimization problem, Lagrange multipliers. Okay. And you can actually treat that in general for any a and any x. In the other cases, what are the other cases? So I'm trying to, to kind of narrow down the number of cases from, well, from 8. Well, where is the maximum going to be achieved? In this picture, on at an extreme point. Okay, why why is it uh, why is the maximum distance achieved at an extreme point and not, let's say, on the boundary, but not not at an extreme point? So wh why is the why is the maximum not achieved here? Well, because if you have a line segment that is in included in that interval. Right? The maximum is always going to be achieved at the one of the endpoints, right? I mean that's heuristic. I mean it's not something that uh, we've proven, and I think you know you, you have to basically prove that yourself. I mean, so so case uh, so for the minimum. You know, basically x1, x2, x3, xn. Let me keep it in general. Xi has to be positive, right? So mu. I mean, again, That's one of the cases. So you look for where, when all mu's are zero. So that basically means uh, what's the kkt? We didn't write what uh, the gradient of f was. Was x right? Plus mu times gradient of g was minus identity plus lambda gradient of h was a right? Gradient's a vector. How, I mean, how can the gradient of A be the matrix A? Well, it's the gradient on. It's not. It's the derivative, if you want. You know, when it, when we write it's this here. Remember, when we write this here. This is actually a matrix. 
because H has N components itself. So it's the it's the gradient with respect to each compo uh, each each component of H. So right. So if you if you think of this as a row, this as a row, then this would be matrices, right? So everything of this will be row. So this gradient has to be a row, right? In fact, that's why, you know, what I wrote there was was um, not x but x transpose. Because then you have a row. Then you have a row times identity, so that's a row, and this is another row, right? So that's to keep lambda and mu as rows. But nothing prohibits you to say, you know, to treat lambda and mu as columns, in which case you'd have to transpose the whole, this whole thing, right? Okay? So, of course, if um, so that again, for the minimum, you you set mu all mu are zero, and then all you have to solve is basically x transpose plus lambda a equals zero, and a x equals b, and um, that's it because. Well, you should be getting x to be positive, but x will be positive. Why? So why why is x x positive not a constraint here when we look for the minimum? Well, there's always going to be a minimum, right? Because it's a convex optimization, and the minimum is going to occur in the set so x in the positive in the in the positive code or in the positive quadrant let's see any, any other one so this took care of the first one mu times x is 0 we said x i mean mu is 0 so that takes care of that uh, this and x positive, right? So basically, that would be what you'd have to solve. So in um, you know in the three by three or three by two case, you know that's what you set up to be the system and you solve. And I think you, you might be able to solve it in general with a little bit of effort. Solve this in general. So x transpose is minus lambda a. So x is minus a transpose lambda transpose. And then plug in there, you'd get what? Minus a a transpose lambda transpose equal b. Right? And of course, A transpose is square matrix, and it's semi-positive definite. So if it turns out that this is a positive definite matrix, it is invertible, and you find lambda to be minus A A transpose inverse B, right? You have lambda transposed. So what's lambda? Well, OK. We have lambda transposed, so now it means that x is minus a transposed minus a a transposed inverse b so it's a transposed 
transpose A, A transpose inverse B. So that's the minimum, okay? I mean, we don't quite know it's a minimum. Well, it's the only solution, right? This is basically, this is, if you have to optimize the distance squared over the entire like uh, affine space AX equals B with no, no constraints on the first quadrant. Right? And we know that has a minimum. So this is the minimum. Right? right? So this is the minimum. This is the minimum. Well, this is the optimal solution for the minimization of one half x squared subject to ax equals b, right? So in particular, it will be the minimum for <coughs> the more restricted problem where you restrict x to be positive as well. And of course, um, in the in part B, A was what matrix? Basically, it was the same matrix as the one in uh, the first problem. I just pick the same. So what's what's A A transposed? Two. One, one, two. Mm. Is that right? Is this positive definite? How do we decide if it's positive or definite? We look for the eigenvalues. So it's a symmetric one, right? So so we have real eigenvalues. So that's 2 minus lambda square. Lambda is 2 plus or minus square root of. Yep. No, OK. So lambda minus 1, lambda minus 3. So it's 1 and 3. So it's positive definite, right? So it means you can take the inverse because there's no zero eigenvalue. And it's we know it's semi-positive definite always. So you know with this formula, this formula will always give you the exact minimum, right? All right. So how do we do about the maximum, though? I mean, that was sort of the. Now, if we if we if we only consider the maximum of this subject to this, but not x positive, is this going to be a, having a solution or no? If we don't include, you know, if we don't restrict the feasible the the the, the, the constraints x positive. Well, even in 2D, that's a line, right? It's an infinite line. So you can go as far as you want to infinity, right? So the, the maximization of, the, of this quadratic function, if you don't have x positive, it doesn't have solution because it goes to infinity, right? So it is important in the maximization to have x positive. And again, why? So the claim is, so next, <clears throat> you have the um, maximization of 1 half x squared subject to ax equals b and x positive. So the claim is that the maximum solution 
is an extreme point for this feasible set. That is, is one of those vertices where sufficient, I mean, some x's are zero. And again, why is that? The, why is that? Um, I mean, again, just look at the picture. Why is the why is the the farthest point from the origin has to occur at at a extreme point? What's the definition of an extreme point? What what? How do we say this is an extreme point and not one here? But what's, so what's the, I mean, this is this is a multi-dimensional one, so it's it's kind of. What is a vertex? It's basically saying that I don't have a I cannot draw a line segment, where the point is like strictly included and the line segment is in the set. You know, I can do it if I'm here, but I cannot do it. I cannot draw a line segment, at a vertex, that is included in the you know. Um, in the set S. So that's what basically is saying that well um, assume the maximum this occurs at a point um, P and P is not extreme point so by contradiction for S. So imagine that I have a point P where is the max is the farthest from the origin, right? But if it's not extreme point, then what can I what can we do? So that means that there is there exists like X and Y Such that you know um, p is t x plus one minus t y. So p is strictly included in the in the line segment. You can draw a line segment, stay in s. Right. So these two points are in s, and t is strictly between zero and one. How do you reach a contradiction? So can you have this and p being the, sh the farthest from the origin? Let's say the origin is here. Now the point is that if you have a line segment like this and the point is in the middle, then one of the extreme is always farther. Right? I mean, how do you show that? It's enough to compute the distance of P squared. So what's the distance of p squared here? P transpose p. That's what you love to do now. And again, with Inner products or, or dot products would be a little bit easier, but you know, well, the matrix notation is the same. So this would be t squared x squared plus twice t one minus t x transpose y or y transpose x is the same plus one minus t squared y squared. I don't know if you've if you if you've used this inequality before. If I multiply two vectors, so x and y, then it's less than or equal than the length of x, length of y. 
Is anybody? Schwartz. Schwartz. It's called Squashy Schwartz in inner product spaces, but if I mean if um, if you've not seen that, you know, you can show that that's that's true. So you can replace this. This guy is strictly positive, right? Because t is strictly between zero and one. So you can replace, make this less than or equal to. You know, t squared x squared plus 2t 1 minus t x y plus 1 minus t squared y squared. And this is a perfect square. It's t length of x plus 1 minus t length of y squared. Okay? So what do you see here? You see that this p, so the length of p is. Basically, it says that the length is a convex function, or the norm is a convex function, because the length of p is less than that same linear combination or, or convex combination of length of x and length of y. But if p was the maximum, you know, if p was the maximum of those, Strictly, you know, at least one is. I think even even so, even 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 greater than or equal to. So we said p is the, is the farthest from the origin, right? So it means this is the case. So it means that this is less than t p plus one minus p uh, my minus t p, and this is p squared. So you got that p squared less than or equal than p squared. So what's the conclusion? Everywhere there was inequality, you must have equality. So you must have equality here, and you must have equality here. And this is in this inequality, equality occurs only when I think one is a multiple of the other. So you can you can continue and basically get a contradiction saying that. Even here, you can see that, you know, if one is strictly inequality, this already gives you a contradiction, right? But if if both are equalities, so it means that this is a hypothesis. It means that p must must equal, and I think already that is giving you a contradiction. Because it means that you're you're on a you are on a unit ball or, or or ball of the same radius compared to the origin, and this is interior to that, so you cannot have the to be the maximum. Anyway, that's that, that was that's not something you are supposed to to do on the exam. Uh, you know, far far from that. But uh, and I, you know, I mean, solving basically all the cases wasn't something that I, I expected that that you can do. But um, coming back here is <coughs> is is clear that now you should actually look for. Uh, the case is when you have when you when the x is on the extreme. So that is when some some components of x are zero. Um, in the three R three with two inequal two equality constraints, that meant that one component has to be zero of x. So that's basically how you you can actually narrow down to just four cases. And the first. The first case was, well, the first three cases is when one of the x's is 0. That's why I listed. When x1 is 0, when x2 is 0, when x3 is 0. And the last one is, is, is when you're in, on the interior. So that's something to um, to the conclusion is the maximum occurs at an extreme point.
Okay. Now let's let me turn to number five, just really sh short. Um, and I want you to kind of see the pattern here. It's always more advantageous, almost always more advantageous to when you look at a minimization problem or whatever, to look at the like metrics metrics representation of that, rather than you know working with the actual quadratic form and stuff. It is it is always better if I say minimize this subject to this. Than, than in part B. I mean, it's always better to, to think of part B as a, as a special case of part A than, than to say, oh, what is this? This is a quadratic form. What is this? It's the sum of x i squared. You know, and again, why is that? I mean, why were the metrics, metrics language invented? Basically, compactify the whole, you know, the whole computation. I mean, when you first learn about matrices, didn't you get? I mean, didn't you ask the question? So, what's the big deal of putting, you know, things in a tableau with no relation to each other? Like, what's a three by three matrix? Oh, just nine numbers. Put it, put it, put them like in three rows and three columns, right? But the point is that you can like, operate with those matrices and, and so forth, so that um, so it just it just makes the computation look I mean a lot more compact. So you have to be again I mean exam has its you know time limitation you know stress and all that. So but you know when you think back you know you got to you got to say well. I don't have any inequality constraints, so it's really a Lagrange multiplier, right? Whether you want to keep the same notation as for a KKT, that's thing. But there is no G. There's no. Okay, so it's just basically the length of x squared mi minus one equals zero. So then it's the gradient of f plus lambda gradient of h equals zero. Subject to, I mean, not subject, but in addition to that h, it has to be zero. Okay, so we computed this many times. The grain of f is just a times. And again, keep in mind this is this is at all of these are at an x. So what's the grain of f at x? A x, right? What's the grain of of h? It's just x, right? Well, there's a two, ah, two, yeah. There's a two in front here and a two in front. Thank you. Yeah, that's why you normally put a one half. Sometimes you see one half, but you're right. So the grain of f is two a x, and the grain of h is two x. So that's the first equation, and of course, the second equation is just length of x equals one. So, you know, factoring out the, I mean, uh, dividing the two, you get that's the system that comes from linear, from, uh, from a Lagrange multiplier method. Okay. Now, why do you think I, I gave you the information about the eigenvalues, or I said the eigenvalues are lambda 1, Through lambda n. Well, even here, you can see the optimal solution x is an eigenvector because it cannot be zero, and it satisfies this eigenvalue equation. 
So this means that x eigenvector and lambda minus lambda the corresponding eigenvalue. Now this minus is just kind of a, a you know, um, it's just because we we wrote the, the Lagrange multiplier like that and not like what you see in Calc three, I guess, or so just putting the minus in front of you. But but this quantity is an eigenvalue, corresponding eigenvalue to the, to the optimal solution, and the optimal value. Now we're going to be talking more and more about this, um, you know, distinction between the optimal solution that would be x. Optimal value would be f of x. So this is f of x is x transpose ax, and this is x transpose minus lambda x. Lambda is a, is a scalar, so it comes like this. So in the end, it's just minus lambda length of x squared, and lang, lam, uh, length of x squared is lambda. So it's minus lambda. So in the end, this is. The optimal x, if you uh, f, the optimal value of f, when you're when you uh, restricting to uh, basically the unit ball, or the unit sphere, um, length of x equals one, is one of the eigenvalues. Well, you only have n eigenvalues, so the minimum is going to be where at the smallest eigenvalue. And the maximum is going to be at the biggest, at the largest second value. So, again, some of you have gotten to this um, equation, and all I wanted more than that was just to compute the optimal value because it's a little bit in the subtlety of the of the question in part b i'm asking find the optimal value so i'm not really asking to find the optimal solution and the value of the optimal solution i'm just saying find the optimal value so it it is um It's enough to find the smallest eigenvalue. So this is the smallest eigenvalue. Of A. And the maximum is the largest eigenvalue of A. So this, you know, I mean, um, it's just something that you might find uh, you might you might encounter in the future is that if I have a matrix A, the smallest eigenvalue has this property that is the minimum of x transpose A x over all unit length x. So for a matrix A, symmetric. Okay, that's what it is, uh, and uh, is the smallest. Well, it's not even clear from here that this minimum value is an eigenvalue. So the, the point is that it is the smallest. eigenvalue of A. And the maximum of this quadratic form over the unit sphere is the is an eigenvalue and is the largest of them. Right? And the ones that are in between, like if you have three eigenvalues that are like strictly less, so one is the smallest, one is the largest, and one is in between. That in between is going to be A subtle point for the uh, quadratic function. I mean, the the corresponding eigenvector is going to be subtle point for the quadratic func uh, expression. Okay? 
So anyway, that was um, okay. Finally, for number six, um, I mean, I basically just asked you to rewrite the, what you wrote in the, I guess, homework, um, and I added this last little question here: What if it's what if a matrix is only semi-positive definite? By the way, this this also works for positive or negative or any any. Um, it doesn't have to be positive definite here. It's the same function as before as as the previous case, right? Now, if it's strictly if it's positive definite the matrix A, then you have um, a straight, I mean, a unique minimum, right? And the minimum corresponds to the, where the gradient is zero. So minimum f with no constraints. Again, this this is no this is unconstrained. Is achieved where a x equals zero. And if if a is positive definite. It means that A inverse exists. It means that you know the optimal is zero. I mean that's right. So the steepest descent method would just basically kind of um, have to go to zero, and the steepest descent you know says x k well says d k minus AXK, so that's the gradient, minus the gradient. And XK plus 1 is XK plus DK squared over DK transpose ADK DK. Now, what breaks down in if it's if x is only semi-positive definite? Hmm? Well, first of all, the minimum is still achieved where the gradient of the quadratic form is zero. So that is is, is still true that. The minimum is achieved there, right? And therefore, the val the minimum value is zero because so um, the minimum of f is achieved when a x star equals zero because that's the gradient, right? Still a convex function, but it's not strictly convex. So, so it means that the minimum value, optimal value, f of x star is zero because it's just x star transpose a x. So the same. So it's the. So the minimum is still zero. But can you can you uh, use that formula for the steepest descent? Well, positive definite matrices guarantee that this denominator is strictly positive for all non-zero non uh, dk, and if dk happens to be zero, you stop because that's you've reached the minimum. The dk is the gradient. So if at some iteration you've stopped, you've got 0 for dk, that's where you stop before you, you apply this formula, right? So this formula is, is used you know, as long as dk is not 0. Now, if it's only semi-positive definite, 
some point at some in some directions this expression may be zero without the direct without dk being zero right so if dk happens to satisfy that dk transpose dk well dk is not zero but this is zero i mean you can you can think of cases that you can imagine cases that would would give exactly that even after the first iteration or something or you could even pick the initial condition x naught so that d naught would satisfy this then you can can you move to x can you move to the next step no because we cannot find xk plus 1 in fact the the conclusion is that what's the conclusion here well you cannot use that uh, that algorithm but it's not hopeless What's the conclusion if dk happens to satisfy something like this? Can somebody give me a reason why a dk has to be zero? One more extra credit problem. So there was one that I, I, I listed last time, but this was another one. Anyway, why is this a good thing? I mean, again, if it happens that you are in a situation where you cannot involve that formula anymore, then the claim is that dk is actually an optimal solution. Remember a? The optimal solution was to satisfy a times x star equals zero. Well, dk is an optimal solution, and that's it. It's not a unique one, right? It's not a, it's not a unique optimal solution, but it is a, an, an optimal solution. It gives you the minimum value. Okay? Anyway, this is a, this is a, a good Again, a good, good uh, exercise. Why is uh, this? I mean, you can take any vector, u. Semi-positive -def, semi definite metrics. u transpose a u equals 0, u non-zero. You must, OK, I'll, I'll let everybody think about it. Then a u has to be 0. Okay, so um, anyway, again, none of this higher level language or, or putting everything in metrics was was really necessary in the exam. So I mean, uh, but but you had to realize that if you don't do this, then you either stop when you have the system. You know, you have five equations, five unknowns. You stop, and then only if you have time, you kind of proceed. Um,
so that you don't you don't run out of time. But um, anyway, it's easier to uh, say than to do it. So. Um, So, this being said, I mean, there is, uh, there is, there are certain things we, we kind of didn't cover. This, um, you know, we talked about conjugate gradient method uh, in the case. In the case when... Uh, um, the objective function was quadratic, right? And the question is, what do you do when you when it's uh, um, for a general um, functional function, objective function f of x, or I think they use g of x. Let's use g of x. Um, that is not quadratic, okay. so other than quadratic. Functions, which were x transpose ax plus bx plus c with the appropriate, you know, rows and column notations. Then, <clears throat> so if you remember from Friday, we said this is the conjugate gradient method is giving the optimal solution in exactly or, or actually uh, in at most n steps where n is the dimension of this so for which the conjugate gradient method uh, gives the optimal in n steps or, or shorter or quicker, okay. Well, then, then uh, the point is that this is not going to be for a general function is not going to be giving you that um, nice of a result. So, nevertheless, um, what's the algorithm? For general G. Basically, one pick x naught, and this could be tricky, right? Why well, could it be tricky? I mean, if you don't have a unique minimum for a, for a, you know a general function like this, if you have two minimum, then you don't you already uh, sort of. If you, if you don't if you don't pick this careful enough, then you might you might convert even with the steepest method or conjugate gradient method to one of the minima rather than the other, right? Um, so I'll just say you pick it carefully. I mean, right? Um, there is a whole theory of how to pick these. Um, you know, you could be sort of picking the um, it's called a sort of basin of basin of attraction. So, or the valley that corresponds to this minimum. So, if you are in this valley, even with the steepest descent, you will never actually gonna go out of it, right? Because you'd have to increase f, uh, g to be able to kind of go to this minimum. So if you're close enough, say close enough to a, a minimum that you know, then you would be converging to that minimum. Second is 
um, stopping criterion. And again, there isn't there isn't a unique criterion that to, to use for stopping, but one will be the gradient of g less than a pre preassigned value. Okay. Or epsilon preassigned, prescribed. All right. Um, so given xk, so now the basically the iteration step, given xk, including x naught, is that set pk to be minus the gradient of g at xk plus um, constant times, well, you know, I kind of prefer to use k plus 1 here, k plus 1, k plus 1, and this is k, where, let's see, we have to say what xk is, xk plus 1 is, xk plus tk pk, right? It says dk. There are lots of typos, yeah. Well, just look in the case when you have um, Well, D stands for the direction you take from the current step to the next step, and that's always in in the, in the conjugate gradients uh, method is is PK, okay? And TK is a minimizer for G at XK plus T. PK. When T is over all reals, right? Now this step is <clears throat> so that's the algorithm. Okay, it's. I mean, it's somewhat. Uh, it is. It is the same as the one in the quadratic uh, function G, except. When g is quadratic, there is a ex easy way to uh, compute the gradient at the new point compared to the gradient. I mean, based on the gradient to the previous point. But if g is not quadratic, you don't have that. It's just whatever the gradient is at that point. Um, and let's see, there was one more typo which said. The initial point, so I guess we should say what P naught is over here. P naught is This case is, is arbitrary. G naught, P naught is G naught. I was uh, feel beta k. We didn't say what beta k is, and beta k. is uh, given by either Fletcher, Reeves algorithm, 
which says the following is the gradient of g at x k squared over the length of the gradient of g x k minus 1 squared and again the difference between this and the quadratic term is that you do this for k equals 1, 2, all the way to n. So you do n steps. You do n steps like this. But you may not, I mean, you don't get to the actual minimum. So if that's the case, Then the very next, the, the very next step, what do you do is actually you set beta to be zero. So you see the next time, I mean, the n plus one t term you get, you go in the direction of the negative gradient. Okay. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? You, you, the p n plus one or n plus two, whatever is no longer going to be conjugate to the previous ones because you can't be conjugate. You can only have n vectors that are linearly independent that are conjugate. So it's it's just mimicking that conjugate uh, you know directions, but it kind of resets the direction at every at every n steps after every n steps. And that's also I guess the case when beta when k is zero. So. N plus one. So let's. In other words, up there they're going to find the n the k plus one. N minus one. K okay. K is zero then, right? So somehow you've got to do your algorithm so that every every multiple of n sets to zero in your uh, math lab somehow. Yeah, and but that what? That's something that I'd like to. And uh. Figure out how you do that because I I don't know if you set it as an integer. I mean, is it just like if the division's an integer, you could you set it to zero or. Oh, how do we implement this? Yeah. Oh. I just use modulo. Oh, how modulo f. Huh? The modulo function. Thank you. Whatever that means. Uh, okay, I'll show you after the break. Okay, I'll show you after the break how they uh, do implement. But, I mean, in the MATLAB code, I'd, did you go n steps? And did you get close to or no? I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know. When we're starting that function, do we still pull it into a, a matrix A, I guess? No. You have to have a gradient. No, I got your email. No. Substitute some numbers into the gradient. No. So you don't you don't kind of uh, embed it into any linear matrix A, B. It's all in terms of the computing the gradients. But, but unless you have a, a symbolic, I couldn't figure out how to do without a symbolic toolbox. You know, to substitute to to make to to uh -huh. some variables and then substitute number you know, okay. values in that. I can't do that remotely. So. I see. How do you um, numerically? Yeah, you should, you should be able to do numerically. Now let me let me just clarify this here once again. The first the first time is the initial choice, right? So you start with zero. I mean, basically, beta equals zero. So you go in the opposite direction of the gradient, right? And that's where there was a typo in the. So pretty much. P naught is going to be in the opposite gradient at X naught. Right? Because beta naught is zero. This is saying P negative one is arbitrary, so that doesn't matter. You don't you don't even use that. And the first time you do it, you do it uh, opposite the gradient. Okay? Evaluated at the arbitrary point. Which we yeah, you pick the arbitrary point, carefully. you go carefully, <laughs> and then you go in the, uh, into the <laughs> steepest you know, uh, descent. The first step is the steepest descent direction. 
the very next time is you compute P1 and that's going to be conjugate to P0 and then you're going to go not in the opposite uh, gradient direction but a combination between that and P0 okay? and P0 after n steps you just you say well I cannot find up, uh, conjugate directions uh, more than n conjugate directions so then you you go again in the steepest descent direction okay so this one doesn't actually optimize it in n steps no and so um, you have to the stopping criteria should be you know when the gradient is less than a certain epsilon um, so let's uh, yeah well so what you do here is, is for, for, for each k equal I mean multiple of n you set a zero and then you you re reuse this uh, this uh, So basically, it's going to be the gradient of Sometimes it's double, sometimes it's single. Why is there a reason? I mean, there, there is no subtle difference that I should, that we should be aware of when he uses single lines there and he uses double lines there. Oh, wait. No, this is the inverse. Oh, that's the inverse, yeah. But there's plenty of places where he does that. One, yeah. There's, there's... Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So in, 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 the, in the homework problem, you have two, two variables, right, x and y. So you're going to be doing two steps, you know, using this formula, and then you're going to set beta equals 0, and so forth. Yeah. And the question is, how do you do this other than symbolically? I mean, you can always discretize, but. And just evaluate it. You can, you can actually, you can do it the long way in the code, just write the evaluation at, you know. So do it by hand, compute derivative by hand, gradient by hand, and just say this gradient square is the two component square, the sum of the two component square. Okay. All right, so um, let, I mean, I, I want, let's take a, a 10 minute break here, unless there are more questions. So. That was a good way to choose T. Exactly, so minimization, it's not a quadratic function. It's a, it's a it's a optimization problem embedded in this optimization problem.